One. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Gudis Barkan. Um, I am the president-elect of the American Society of Cytopathology, and welcome to our webinar Wednesday. Uh, today, we have two guest speakers. Um, both of them are cytotechnologists, and the topic will be about uh, glandular lesions in gynecologic cytology, one of the most difficult areas in gynecologic uh, cytology, if you ask me or really anyone else doing this. Uh, let me introduce both of our uh, uh, speakers to you. Um, our first speaker is uh, Michelle Smith, who is a cytotechnologist with uh, more than 30 years of experience um, in the field. And uh, she's one of our uh, American uh, uh, Society of Cytopathology executive board members. Now, Michelle has done uh, various cytology positions uh, from bench to management and education in the hospital, public health, and private laboratories. She's currently the program manager for the Master of Science in Biotechnology and Applied Biotechnology programs at the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, as I said, she's our executive board cytotechnologist member, but she's also members of various committees on the ASC, um, like the Ambassador Committee, the Cell Committee, the Educational Resource Task Force, which brings you this educational session today. Uh, in addition, she has other, uh, has had held other positions, like being the ASCT Commissioner to the CAHEP and uh, being a member of the uh, CPRC. She's also on the Hologic Digital Cytology Board. Um, our second speaker is uh, Eileen Ludlow, who is also a cytotechnologist and who has had more than 30 years of experience in cytology. She's currently employed by Hologic, and uh, she has uh, dedicated herself to developing cytology educational materials like cytologystuff.com and so forth. And we are delighted to have both of you here today. And we're delighted that you're going to be talking about this difficult subject and uh, teaching us about it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is Michelle, and I'm going to be your main talker today. And uh, Eileen, um, I called her the, just earlier the uh, kind of behind the scenes guru, which um, is what a lot of us cytotechs like to be, kind of the, the people behind the scenes. So, um, we do have to um, or would like to disclose to everyone listening um, that we do have um, some partnership with Hologic. Um, Eileen works part time with Hologic and I'm like uh, Guli said, I'm on the Digital Cytology Advisory Board. So Eileen, you have anything else to say? <laughs> no, that was perfect, Michelle. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, we're going to go with the game plan here first, um, which there we are. Um, we're going to have quite a few polls to play with uh, for this next hour and a little bit more, I would guess. Then we're going to do some review of criteria for abnormal and normal GYN glandular cells and lesions. We're going to do a lot of case studies. We have um, quite a few of them. Hopefully, we'll get to most all of them. And then at the end, we'll do some discussion about them. So from terms from an objective, this is something that Eileen and I were kind of playing around with um, to bring to Cytotex earlier. And then with the pandemic, this seemed like a perfect place to, to roll it out. Um, what we really wanted to do was talk about recognizing glandular cell abnormalities using um, the Bethesda system um, mostly and how to classify atypical glandular cells accordingly. And we would also then talk about um, discussing AGC as a criteria using digital cytology. We've all been trained using a regular microscope, but as the pandemic came into play and um, with more and more technology availability, um, we can do this digitally as well. So that's kind of what we wanted to play with a little bit today. And we're going to demonstrate some criteria um, to these unknown cases. So I think we're going to start right off with a poll. Um, basically, um, we know there's a lot of people on online. So the first poll, um, which Joanna's got up, which is, please 
best describe your title, whether or not you're a student in cytology, a pathology resident, a cytotech, or a pathologist. Okay, go. I don't know if I'll see them. Okay, if you can't, I can read it for you if you want. I can see them. Okay, So perfect. the majority, yeah, almost half um, are cytotechs um, with a few cytotech students along with us to be a little bit over 50%, it looks like, and then pathologists at 38% and 10% residents. This is great. Okay, so the next poll kind of follows in with this and how many years of experience do you have? Um, so we can start that poll. And I, I feel like I just have to go, go. <laughs> well, and it looks like we have a good mixture of... Um, of experience levels. So um, with about every kind of little layer of one to five, about 20% and kind of every 10 years after that, uh, another 20 to 30%. So um, we do have 30% of people with um, over 25 years of experience. So I have to say, um, I hope you enjoy this as well. Sometimes the more we know, um, the harder it is. So let's just get going into it all. Okay, we're going to start with our first case. Think of this kind of as a pretest. We have a 60-year-old woman who's postmenopausal and has a complaint of postmenopausal bleeding. And what we're going to do is we we're logged in. I've logged into the server that will have all these slides that will be available. Um, if you are doing the weekly slide test with um, Hologic, then you're you probably are familiar with this. If not, um, this might be a nice little way to get familiar with it. We're trying not to be a commercial, um, but this is really a nice educational opportunity just to see a lot of slides and a lot of cells that you've never seen before. So, um, and if you can see here, what happens is it basically breaks up the tile of um, what is on the liquid-based cytology and you would probably go around and you can click on each tile, um, but because I got control, you're gonna have to follow along with me. Um, we're first gonna look at this uh, tile, which um, I just wanna let you think about the this background a little bit, um, along with these like very short columnar or cuboidal-like cells, and we're gonna and a few um, squamous cells in the background for um, to kind of give you some orientation. Then I'm going to show you this slide, which again, looks very columnar to me, maybe a strip, a strip of columnar cells that got twisted on the end, which means these little nuclei, I, I think are still in um, a nice alignment. Here we go, we have a bunch of small cells here. I'm gonna move them up a little bit so you can see them. Maybe a little spindly action here with elongated, um, cytoplasm. The chromatin isn't that coarse um, too much, but they're pretty crowded, right? I'm going to show you this picture. to a little bit of a papillary type group here. Looks fairly columnar. And then I'm going to show you this one, which is a nice tight cluster of small cells that are hyperchromatic. Um, and a little bit irregular. Now, if we were at our regular microscope, we might be able to focus kind of through these cells a little bit, but on digital cytology, we do, we can't. We I do have a little bit of um, some play with some um, light coming through. So you can kind of see the chromatin pattern here um, and a little bit of this kind of fuzzy background. One thing, Michelle, if you don't mind, Go if people are not familiar with the site, is that when we have um, um, scanned these slides, we scan them in layers. 
And so to Michelle's point, we don't have the ability to focus up and down, but the, the groups that we'll see will be somewhat um, flatter looking because the layers have been um, kind of stacked together. So you should still be able to see some decent nuclear detail, even though you can't focus. Okay. Now we're going to go into some pretty good um, clustering here of a cell group. And I'm just going to put it down to low power, which you can see kind of where it lands um, and how the um, patterns play into being there. I think that here, the nuclei, again, we're seeing some ovoid type nuclei. Um, some of this fringy, you know, I have to wonder, is it diathesis or something else? Um, and those are the ones I'm going to show you just now. And I'm going to jump back in to my PowerPoint. And the next is poll number three for case number one. And basically, we want to know what your interpretation is so far based on the slides I showed you. We have everything from NILM, and this should include um, endometrial cells in a patient over 45. Remember, this patient is 60, high-grade atypical glandular cells or adenocarcinoma of endometrium or um, not otherwise specified. Go. <laughs> I feel like the uh, British Bake Show. Bake. <laughs> <laughs> No. I don't see. Oh, there they are. Okay. So 50% of you thought uh, atypical glandular cells. And um, and then some thought all the way up to adenocarcinoma endometrium and about the same amount um, adenocarcinoma not otherwise specified. Next, I'm going to show you my next slide here. Where am I? I somehow have lost my ability to move forward. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here we are on the cases. These, I'm going to give you the results of what the initial lab called this case, which was atypical glandular cells, endometrial type. They also thought there might be some atypical endocervical cells going on. Um, we have the ability uh, to look at what uh, some of the CAS, the CAS people for Hologic, when they're reviewing these cases to put on the website, what their interpretation is. So there was 29 CAS who did this as well, and 59% thought adenocarcinoma. So a little bit more towards an adenocarcinoma versus just atypical glandular cells for this group of people. And then we have some biopsy uh, follow-up information. And this case, actually, an endometrial biopsy was performed. And it was a well-differentiated endometrial adenocarcinoma. So I would say for this first little pretest, everyone is on the right page and getting on the same boat, right? So this is kind of what we're going to be doing going forward. But first... We're going to talk about some criteria. So let's start with the normal. Of course, you know that we have to kind of talk about what's normal first before we can talk about what's abnormal. And for the endocervical cells, we're looking at columnar groups of tall, um, elongated cells with the nuclei that are basally located. The cytoplasm is usually finely vacuolated. Um, chromatin generally uh, finely granular as well. Um, the nucleoli, usually we don't see that many in a uh, normal glandular uh, endocervical cells, but we can, they will pop up for reactive and of course abnormal things. On the other side for our endometrial cells, these are mostly found in groups. I'll tell you, uh, we don't have many students on so far. Maybe they're all in their clinical rotations. Um, but I hated endometrial cells when I was a student and had to kind of learn to love them a little bit. So um, going all full circle. Um, the cytoplasm is very scant, so these are cuboidal. Um, the chromatin, very dark. We typically should be seeing these on days 1 to 12 of the menstrual cycle. Reasons why they might fall after day 12 include IUD or other um, contraceptive methods, endometrial polyps, or abnormal cells. Um, with the new kind of brushes, and I shouldn't say new anymore. That just shows how old I am. 
But with um, the collection techniques, we sometimes can see lower uterine segment sampling. And these are basically those abraded endometrial cells that come off in these huge flat sheets. And when we see them, we kind of freak out a little bit. Um, but again, we have to look at the patterns that we're going to be playing with first. Okay, so that was my quick little normal um, glandular cells. And now we're going to talk about atypical glandular cells. These are, um, I'm just going to go through the, basically what was in the handout that we sent out to you earlier. If you don't have it already, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. But I'm just going to kind of highlight various different parts of um, endocervical and endometrial cells found in cervix now. So we call these atypical glandular cells. If you work with old people or um, in a lab where everyone is old, they may still say agus. Um, we try to get away from that terminology, which is atypical glandular cells of undetermined significance. The idea with the last Bethesda system is atypical glandular cells makes is just much more concise and to the point. So try and change um, all of those old people as jargon, I would say. That's your the new the new thing you should be doing. So when we're talking about atypical glandular cells, um, we have NOS, meaning not otherwise specified. They're just not, um, not normal anymore. Something has changed. And we also, for endocervical and regular glandular cells, we could say favor neoplastic. We do not say favor neoplastic for any endometrial cells. We just leave that at the NOS area. Then after that atypical part, we do have endocervical carcinoma in situ, which is the identity. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit later. And then adenocarcinoma. So um, as a cytotech, and I'm sure like everyone else in the laboratory, I like organization and I like putting things in bins. So what I did was I took um, the little... Um, handout that you had and I put them in my little bins of when I'm thinking of what makes things abnormal and how can I follow through and see when they're normal versus abnormal. So I always think of the nucleus first. This tells the story of whether things are abnormal or not. Um, and then look at the chromatin and then port borders and patterns of the cytoplasm. So um, for atypical endocervical cells, not otherwise specified, basically it's just a little bit more of, right? There's a little bit more nuclear enlargement, maybe three times the north size of normal, most likely a little bit less. Um, you might see some changes in size. The chromasia, um, it's a little more hyperchromatic. Um, the borders, you might see nuclear membranes might not be round. They might starting to get irregular. And then the patterns of the, the groups that we see, we'll see nuclear overlap. Um, and over some crowding and maybe a little bit of pseudostratification. We can see some nucleoli here, but we're, we usually don't, I would say. Um, but you can, along with some mitotic figures. For um, atypical endocervical cells favor neoplastic, again, we're on that spectrum, right? So we're going a little bit more again. Here's where the nuclei, I think, go from being more round to elongated and more more than just oval, more squished in on the sides. Um, the chromatin, again, more hyperchromatic. You're going to see a little bit more of the coarsening of that chromatin. The borders are going to start to be ill-defined. They're going to be less cohesive. Um, the patterns that we're going to see, the starting of rosettes or feathering, but maybe not overtly into an AIS type of situation. Again, the crowding, the overlapping. So in those groups, we're going to have more overlapping and crowding rather than less. Um, again, nucleoli are always um, part of the game. So atypical um, glandular cells that are endometrial type. Sorry. There we go. The criteria that is on your handout include nuclei that are enlarged compared to normal. Remember, they're about 35 microns in normal, but they're going to be a little bit enlarged. We're going to have some hyperchromicity. They're already hyperchromatic. So that one, I, you know, is kind of a little, for me, is a bit of a change up, but um, 
but it is part of the handout. And um, but one of the things that we know as it gets a little bit more hyperchromatic, the heterogeneity of that chromatin stays the same. So it's still very smooth as you're looking at it. Um, might see some nuclei, um, small nucleoli, single cells or 3D clusters, again with crowding, and you might start seeing some vacuolization of the cytoplasm. Now we're gonna play into uh, AIS. And um, I have to say that when I was a student in the late 80s, I had two teachers. One teacher hated AIS. She was not a believer of it. The other one was. And it was the first time I think that I was able to start appreciating differences in criteria and philosophies and all of that stuff. I would say that my first teacher also did not like change. Um, AIS has been around for a very long time, um, but it wasn't really specifically categorized until the 80s, but it was it is in papers back in the 70s and 60s as well. So it's really nothing new. Um, here are the things though that I would say, oopsie, that um, to think about here is that nuclei um, are definitely going to be elongated here, more oval to elongated than round. The chromatin is going to be um, coarsely granular. So you're going to start seeing some dots, if you will, in that chromatin pattern. The borders, again, more ir irregular than smooth. And of course, our friend for the pattern for AIS is the feathering um, and hyperchromatic crowded groups, the pseudostratification or rosettes. We can see nucleoli um, and mitosis or apoptotic figures might be present as well. Remember here that the background is going to be clean. Now we're going to go right into adenocarcinoma and a cervical type. Um, again, it's just more of um, where I've been talking about, but with a few more added features. So the pleomorphism is going to be more. Um, their regular chromatin is going to be more. Nucleoli, definitely we're going to see that a lot more once we get to adenocarcinoma. Again, and also single cells and tumor diathesis. These are the kind of the three things that I always think about when I'm trying to decide between AIS and going right into endocervical adenocarcinoma is going to be the idea of nucleoli, single cells, and diathesis. And this is where cytotechs kind of, and pathologists for GYN and especially glandular, I would say, since we're talking about it today, um, is where we really fit in together in this very nice kind of puzzled game plan, right? That the cytotechs, we're the ones that are going to locate these cells. We're going to identify them. We're the ones that are first going to make these fine distinctions between this criteria. And we're going to mark the cells accordingly and document them so that the pathologist um, has a little bit more um, knowledge of, of what we thought going in, which I think so that they're not going in blind. So it's it's kind of where we, um, I think, as um, cytopathology partners really work well together. And of course, the cytotechs, you know, we are the locating um, gurus, I would say there. That's my own commercial there, though. So um, the endometrial adenocarcinoma, Again, it is again about more. Nuclear size is um, going to vary now. So we're going to see a little bit more changes in the nuclei size and some loss of polarity. They're not necessarily going to be together. You're going to see some single cells or things trying to um, be a little more discohesive. The hyperchromasia can um, be still pretty hyperchromatic, but also we do sometimes see that um, hypochromasia for endometrial endocarcinomas. Chromatin, find a course, we're going to see nucleoli, single cells and 3D clusters, again with the crowding. Hopefully we'll see some vacuolated cytoplasm, that's also helpful. And those intracytoplasmic morphonuclear leukocytes, those um, poly bags as people sometimes call them, and this watery diathesis. And I would say, you know, full disclosure, the watery diathesis for me in terms of a criteria and how to identify it and see it took me at least five years. I'm, you know, I am not ashamed to say it that, you know, when I was a student, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I know what that's supposed to be, but I didn't know um, until I was a tech for quite a few years. So maybe some remedial there, I don't know, but just part of the thing. So now if we talk about differentials, 
those are what I've just talked about. And I know I'm going fast, but I want to get to those cases. Um, was all of the atypical parts in the adenocarcinomas, right? But there are going to be some differentials. And one of them that is the bane, and I think why glandular cytology is so hard, is this reactive endocervical cellular changes. So this is where there's, again, not a lot, but slight changes into normal cells um, where we might see things, but not so many. So that's where the cytotech comes in to really start looking at all of those groups and determining whether or not should I move them forward or are they reactive? And if they are reactive, is it still something that someone should see um, and why? And, you know, I think that patient um, history, ages, all of that comes to play as well. Um, and again, and how many of them are there? Is it just one group? Is it 18? Is it 30? You know, those are things that um, everyone is going to be assessing. Um, the differentials for benign endometrial cells, again, a little bit um, of the average of the nuclear size is 35. So it's going to be like yeah, that whole idea of looking at intermediate nuclei um, and deciding whether or not are these nuclei bigger, smaller, what's happening. The chromatin and the denseness of the chromatin is um, something to think about when we're talking about benign endometrial cells. Um, generally speaking, not going to see nucleoli in benign endometrial cells. The groups are still going to be dense in that 3D. And if we can get um, to see the, the two um, epithelial and stromal component, that is obviously very helpful. The NC ratios very much stay um, high. Okay. Now, um, high-grade intraepithelial lesions for squamous um, conditions, especially if there's glandular involvement, isn't going to be a differential for any atypical glandular cells that we see. Um, here's things to remember here. Nuclear size is variable. Um, they can be as large as low-grade cells or they might be smaller. Um, the chromatin, we're going to see fine to coarse, but generally evenly distributed. We're not going to see um, clearing in that chromatin at all. Um, the nuclear membranes might be irregular, um, but we might, and we probably will see some indentations and grooves, especially in those little metaplastic cells, but we're not going to talk about them really that much today. Um, nucleoli is basically not present also in high grade or high cell. The last differential I'm going to talk about is. Um, Poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Um, here is where we're going to see very irregular cells um, that have marked changes in sizes and shapes. The chromatin is going to be very coarse and irregular. This is where we're going to see clearing in parts of that nucleus and then very dark areas as well. Nucleoli um, is part of the game. Those spindle cells or caudate cells um, are very helpful. And of course, if there's um, keratin, um, that makes our differential a little bit easier, but we don't always see that. Um, tumor diathesis is also part of um, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. All right, now we're going to go on to case number two. And we're going to run out of time. I know that already. Okay. I'm going to go back and forth between these um, areas. And let's just start for this one. This is a 60-year-old lady um, who has been postmenopausal for years. That's all we know about her. So we have this case. We have some cells here. Um, again, looks a little bit columnar to me, kind of finely granular. Some little maybe diathesis hanging off the sides. Not quite sure yet. Um, here's another group that looks like endocervical cells to me on face. Um, again, here's where the chromatin, pretty smooth, maybe a few chromocenters, um, and maybe a little bit crowding, right? They're a little bit touching. And when I was playing with this presentation, all I could think now is social distancing versus, um, um, drunken honeycomb. So I would say these are a little too close, don't have masks, um, and now I'm going to look at, let's look at this one. Here is some cells here, the metaplastic cells. 
I think here with some maybe a regular little irregular nuclei to look at. I'm going to look at this slide here. So again, crowded endocervical cells. You can tell here it's nice. It shows you your columnar part over here. But again, they're all touching, maybe a little too close. Some overlapping. Um, and here's another group. Again, we can tell that they're endocervical cells. Um, the nuclei are fairly round. They're not oval. They're not, I would say, not elongated. Maybe a little oval. Um, and the chromatin from one part of the group over here looks like you could swap them around and they would stay together. So in terms of the group, these are friends. Um, but are they just... Um, a little too crowded or um, are they normal? That's the question I guess we have to ask. So now we will go to poll number four. And what's your interpretation? Basically negative. Remember a 60 year old lady, does she have endometrial cells? Or is it high grade atypical glandular cells, AIS or endometrial adenocarcinoma? Go. I'm not seeing this. Oh, there it is. Okay. So most all of us thought atypical glandular cells of some assemblance and with a few other things, someone thought maybe a little bit more endometrial adenocarcinoma, some thought AIS. So let's go to our next case slide here. There we go. The lab called it atypical glandular cells like most of the people here. So we're all in agreement there for the CAS. They jumped a little bit higher, I would say, um, and thought, well, actually, no, 41% here also thought atypical glandular cells followed by um, high cell and um, nine thought adenocarcinoma. So a biopsy was done for this patient or actually an endocervical um, curatage and it was an endocervical polyp. So those endocervical cells that we saw in that case were um, reactive to the polyp. So there you are. All right. So our third case, now we're just going to talk cases. So. And I wish we could have more interaction. Unfortunately, you're just going to hear me kind of yammer on a little bit. But so it's a 55-year-old lady. Um, again, no history. Can't remember when her last menstrual period was. And here are the cells. Again, we're seeing, you know, maybe not quite as um, uh, cellular. But if you look at these, these tiles right here, there should be something that jumps out um, right away and that's the background so and here we have this group of cells where i'm gonna kind of make it a little bit darker there to see a little bit better um which is very tightly compacted hyperchromatic group and then right below it is another one maybe a little more hyperchromatic i'm going to open this up a little bit more so you can see them maybe a chroma center here but it does look columnar in some way to me, if you look at the edge on the group. Here we have another group of cells here, small, but here's where the NC ratio has jumped, right? So um, we have some groups of cells that have a little more NC ratio and these don't. Also very the chromatin, pretty coarse. It's just two cells hanging out. And then this one, we have another one where we have some cells, hyperchromatic, and one that's a little bit irregular um, and um, much bigger than the other one. I think if we look, it might actually be more than one. It's hard to tell. Maybe two, maybe one over the top. And then I'm going to look at this group here, which again, we have this big cluster of cells. Oh, it's too dark. If we look at 10X, there's a few squames hanging around. 
but a very hyperchromatic group. Um, maybe some of these nuclei on the ends are trying to run away. So maybe not as um, polarity as we would like. Here is um, the last picture I'm going to show you where we have a nice big group of cells um, that look like they're parts of them have a little more crowding in some areas than others. If I look over here, we also have starting to see some changes in nuclear size. So if you look up at the front at the top here, pretty small, and then down below, quite a much bigger change there. So we do have some variation in size. Now we're going to go to the poll. So what's your interpretation here? Oh, I'm getting a spinning wheel of death. Okay. So again, we're at negative, high grade, atypical glandular cells, AIS, or endometrial adenocarcinoma. And there's some pictures just to help you look. And 45% thought endometrial adenocarcinoma and 30% AIS. So we had those kind of the, where those cells are starting to fall away. Um, okay. And a few smattering here and there. In terms of the lab results, they thought atypical endometrial cells. So be NOS. The CAS folks thought 86% um, or 24 of the 28 people that looked at this case before you did thought adenocarcinoma as well. So um, a biopsy was, or actually a hysterectomy was performed for this patient and it was poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. So spot on. See, we all know this. It's not that hard. Okay. Here's the fourth case. It's a 60 year old lady. Again, doesn't know when the last menstrual period was. And and now from the last picture that we saw for that last case, number three, with a head, all of that diathesis in the background, consider the background here. Not as pretty clean, I would say, but there's some big cells that we want to talk about here. So we have this one group of cells. If we look at the cells that are next to it, these are pretty, pretty big cells. And I mean, I blew out the light there so you could see them. Um, but here, maybe some dense cytoplasm, although it's very smooth and round. Here we have another group here. I'm gonna break down the thing. And we're seeing these large vacuoles coming through and some big nucleoli, right? But very round, knobby cells. And I'll tell you, when I was looking at this slide, I kept thinking about, you know, am I in GYN or am I in, you know, a pleural effusion or something? Because the knobbiness was kind of getting to me. Um, and we have this one, this slide here where we have a group of cells maybe trying to be a little bit of a rosette over here along with another kind of flat sheet that has some nuclei that are very irregular, very lumpy, bumpy. And the chromatin is fairly smooth, I would say, but coarse. Okay. All right. Make this one a little bit darker. I'm going to go to 10x here so you can see that the, the picture, there are hyperchromatic crowded groups in a lot of places. You would spend a long time looking at all these and mainly because they are very, really nice to watch and look at, I'd be looking at too many. And then in this group, we have some polys maybe or apoptotic figures that have been engulfed in this group. Look at the pattern of, the, of this group though. Fairly smooth with little bump outs, right? Okay, so now we're going to go to the poll. So again, not all of these will have interpretations, but 
we're kind of going with that for right now. Okay. All right. So 45% thought adenocarcinoma endometrial, 13% and a cervical, and 38%. NOS. So everyone is pretty much in agreement that this is an adenocarcinoma of some sort. Lab results agreed adenocarcinoma uh, NOS. Um, the CAS, same agreement, although 3% thought, could this be a squamous? Actually, it's just one person thought, could this be squamous origin? And biopsy was done. This was a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with a clear cell contingent. So it was those bubbles, those, those vacuolated cytoplasm, which made we all think of an adeno of some sort. Um, but it's just a very nice looking kind of bubbly uh, case there. Um, in the biopsy, they could not determine whether or not it was endocervical or endometrial. Of course, if you're a student, we're always talking about DES exposure when we're talking about clear cell adenocarcinoma, but of the vagina, not of the cervix. So, but, okay. Case five, the 42-year-old woman, her LMP was a month ago. We know really nothing else. Here is this case. Again, very clean background. We have some squames up on top here. We have a few single cells. This is a binucleated one. Here is one that's all by itself. Cytoplasm is kind of shot, I would say, so can't really say much about this one. We can go over here, and I think here's your money shot. It's beautiful, elongated cells um, that are glandular. The chromatin has that salt and peppery look to them, kind of coarse. But because we can, we're going to look at this one as well. Again, here are just these cells trying to fall away. This group of cells just make me think of dancing, um, like a interpretive dance, I guess I would say. And then we have another deep cluster, very hyperchromatic. Cells are touching, they're overlapping. We have some chromocenters. Um, here in this group, they're not trying to run away. We're not seeing feathering. We're just seeing a group of cells. So let's go to, here is a poll um, where we're not asking you necessarily for your interpretation because I think um, the feathering kind of tells you the story there. But what is the most useful criteria here? Um, which I might have just told you. So are we talking about syncytial groups, macronucleoli, finely granular chromatin, or hyperchromatic crowded groups? Go. And hyperchromatic crowded groups, um, by far, everyone thought so, and I would agree. Syncytial groups, you know, is all of that, is that squamous or glandular? Um, hyperchromatic crowded groups um, also could be squamous, but here, there, we're going to think about glandular as, instead. So the CAS, as you know, um, and the lab all thought AIS for the most part, um, few people wanted to go a little bit higher and a few people wanted, thought it was more high grade, which I think was those single cells um, that I showed you initially that might bring you to looking at um, squamous versus um, ad, or, uh, AIS. And as you know, you've seen CIS and AIS sometimes can look very much um, alike. So... Okay, case number six. We have 
24 year old lady. Um, she has an IUD. She has a history of abnormal pap smear. So finally, we have some history along with um, a high risk HPV positive diagnosis. Again, pretty clean background. Um, we have these types of cells, dense cytoplasm, hyperchromatic cells, some irregular notched um, nuclear borders. Uh, one teacher told me once when you're talking about these kind of cells of determining high grade or not, you know, could you drive a car all the way around if you think the nucleus is... Um, a mountain and the cytoplasm is the um, land. Can you drive all the way around? Which you can in this bigger cell. But over here on this one, if you were to drive around, you would be probably in the water over on this side. So something to think about. Um, he claimed that if you couldn't go all the way around, think about high grade. So here are some more cells there. This group of cells, pretty hyperchromatic and very, very coarse, right? Um, and high NC ratio with a little bit of elongated nuclei. And because we can't really see the cytoplasm that much, but that's as dense is this first picture that I showed you, right? So I, you would want to know, is this, could it be glandular or um, is it squamous? Here is another group. Um, I would bring your attention to this cell over here that has little two indentions. Um, some people have been trained to call these tulip cells. Um, and if you know what that means, you know I'm giving you a little bit of a hint. But again, you can't drive your car around. A lot of these things, very irregular nuclear borders and hyperchromatic um, nuclei um, that's pretty coarse. So let's go to the polls. Poll number eight. And here's the question. Um, does a history of abnormal PAPs with a positive H, uh, high-risk HPV influence you in the differential of this case? Yes or no? And then my question, which you can't answer, but something to think about is, would it be knowledgeable if, it was, if you could specif specify whether it was a 16 or 1845 case? Um, and a discussion for a different day of um, HPV knowledge before or during sign out of a case. So yeah, most of us think that um, this would be helpful to know um, and that it is helpful to know that there are HPV um, positivity. This is part of um, why we do our work, right? So the CAS... Um, all thought it was high grade, and so did the lab, and the biopsy was a CIN 2 or 3, um, but I think that this is a nice case where you can see that when sometimes when these high grade cells um, are very dark and small, that you do have to consider a glandular lesion as well. Okay, case number seven is a... 51-year-old woman who also has an IUD and her LMP was two weeks ago. Okay, so here we have this case. Um, look at the background a little bit here. I'm going to jump right into here where we can see this group. I'm going to move it around a little bit so you can see it. Go on to 10x. You can see how big this kind of street strip of cells are. And now we're going to look at the nuclei a little bit here. And, you know, they have a little bit hyperchromasia. We have a round one. We have an elongated one. Maybe a little bit different sizes and shapes. Um, and over here, a little bit more crowded. But we can definitely tell that these are glandular endocervical cells. Um, and this one, I think, is just beautiful, but some elongation. And then we have this case, this slide here, this tile, um, which again, um, 
I think that some people would think that it would be hard to look at ectino or decide about ectino on digital microscopy, but I think it's fairly easy, even though, um, you know, we can see, it looks that same idea of cotton candy, maybe even more so in my opinion on digital cytology. Um, but it just kind of furry and fuzzy. And here's another picture of some actino. So I just wanted to show you the actino case. And we're gonna go back here. And of course, actinomyces, this case was called NILM by the um, lab. And someone did note reactive endocervical cells. The HPV was negative for this patient. Um, there was a biopsy and endocervical curatage that was done and no lesion was found. So there was 71% of the CAS folks thought that it was negative. There were three that still thought that these were a little bit atypical glandular cells. So here's the question for this poll number nine. Are you more likely to call this case NILM based on the clinical history of IUD or not? Um, meaning basically I'm kind of like trying to think about bias um, and kind of protocols and laboratories. Um, if you had not seen that tino, would you have wanted to maybe push this to atypical glandular cells? Just something to think about. And what we're thinking as we're evaluating these cases. And the answer is, yeah, sure. Because we have a reason for why these are a little bit reactive, right? Um, with the actinomyces. The patient still got a biopsy um, and endocervical curatage. So just something to, um, you know, from a clinical standpoint, they did. But um, this is why history is important. Although we all know that, right? Okay, case number eight. 53-year-old lady, we know nothing else. And I just want to make sure I got the right one. So now we have um, a specimen and it doesn't look very cellular. Um, there is some background that we should pay attention to, blood. Um, we'll see what we see from there. So I'm going to look at this picture first. I'm going to make it a little darker for you. So you can see that pretty high NC ratios here. The chromatin, um, you know, I can make it a little bit darker. It is coarse, but it's also starting to get, you know, a, a little, not irregular quite, but very, it's coarser than I would expect to see. And then we're going to look at this slide. And again, here's another very tight cluster. We have blood in the background. Um, Pretty round cells, but um, also a little bit um, overlapping here. And then we're going to look at this one. This case, these cells is just three right here hanging out, but some pretty irregular nuclear um, borders hanging out here. Um, and then if we look at this one, I'm going to go to 10X and kind of show you how big of a cluster um, and group that this actually is part of. And now I'm going to go in a little bit deeper and we're going to look at these nuclei and we're going to see that there is some changes in size and shape. We have elongated size. We have some round ones. We have some larger ones that are almost two times at least or more or three times the size of the smaller ones. Um, you know, maybe a rosette-like thing happening over here. Um, I don't want to lead you down any road here. Now we're going to look at this slide here, this or this image. And we have, again, a very tight cluster. We have one cell that's trying to run away. Um, very elongated group here. Some chromocenters. Maybe a little bit irregular chromatin pattern here where we have a thick nuclear um, rim, but then um, a little bit lighter in some places and then some elongation. Okay. So, so for this poll, we're going back to the interpretation. What would you like to call this case? High grade, 
or uh, atypical glandular cells, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, NOS, or just straight up carcinoma. Remember, a 53-year-old lady, we don't know anything more. If I'm on my right page, yep. Okay, we're a little bit over the, all over the map here. 35% wanted to call it atypical glandular cells, followed by 30% or 29% actually for adenocarcinoma. And then other uh, choices were AIS, um, squamous cell carcinoma, and a high grade. So lots of different ideas going on here. I can tell you that the lab thought it was a squamous cell carcinoma. And the CAS results, we had about the same idea as what um, this group thought of. Um, 53, about half of the people that looked at this case thought it was uh, atypical glandular cells along with the adenocarcinoma. Few people, one person thought squamous cell, one thought AIS, and one thought um, just carcinoma not otherwise specified. And this really was a infiltrating, um, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. And I think that, um, I'm going to go back to that the case really quick, that some of this cytoplasm is, is really hard to discern. But I guess the question is, is it more dense than finely vacuolated? And maybe not as columnar, right? Um, so, but I think that, you know, saying adenocarcinoma NOS might not be that different as well. I don't know if we would see these kind of very strange nuclear features um, in a squamous. But just something to think about. Okay, nine. Here we are, 48-year-old woman. And I know we're close to one o'clock. So I think we're, after this case, let's talk about how we want to go farther or where we want to break it up. Okay. This one. So we have um, lots of hyperchromatic crowded groups here, right? Um, with some elongated cytoplasm. Here, nucleoli. Um, very more elongated, I would say, almost than round. Maybe a little bit of both. Um, this is a great group of cells, in my opinion. I could look at them all day. We have some hyperchromasia, maybe a little bit of coarsening, especially over here. Some elongation, small, large, lots of variation in sizes and shapes. And then we have this group here, again, we can tell down by the bottom here that we have columnar cells. We have some elongation. Some of the cells are trying to run away. Um, and I'll show you one more quick. This one. This one, some people might call this like one of those fan tails, but very hyperchromatic, very coarse chromatin, chromocenters, I would say. Um, but here's where that maybe finely granular chromatin comes to play. Okay, so now we're going to go to the poll. What's your interpretation? Do you think this is more of a high grade or atypical glandular cells, AIS, or adenocarcinoma? So 46% say adenocarcinoma, NOS. And then 42% said atypical glandular cells. 7% um, a high cell. And now let's look and see what the cats people thought. 
So this, the lab called it adenocarcinoma. And the CAS, um, also uh, AIS or adenocarcinoma, you did not have the choice to say AIS in the poll. Um, so a lot of you went with adenocarcinoma. So we're all kind of in the same um, realm here. And the biopsy or hysterectomy um, was an endocervical adenocarcinoma. Oh, shoot. There we go. All right. I'm trying to check on time here. It's 201, Michelle. 201. Should we do a few more? Or go for questions? I don't know. Gulise, can you see if there's any questions to be had, or should um, there we just go? Are a couple of questions, but maybe if you want to do one more and then stop up halfway. Okay, okay. The questions. Perfect. Okay, so this is a 39 year old patient. We don't know anything. Although, you know, I, pretty much I've worked in four different states and so many different types of labs. And I don't know, maybe it was always the labs that I worked at where they're, to me, not getting history is n nothing new. I hope that that's not the case for you. <laughs> but again, now that we have electronic health records, maybe it's a little bit easier. Okay, so here's a case. Um, again, pretty clean background. We have hyperchromatic crowded groups. This one I'm going to bring your attention to. This is the first slide or uh, tile that we saw that looks like um, like it's trying to be a low cell maybe. I'm not sure. And then we have this group here. Again, pretty um, hyperchromatic and a little bit coarse. Um, and I don't know how else to say it, but like that salt and pepper or dotty dots within the, the chromatin. Um, when I'm thinking about it, we have some elongated parts and we have some that are round nuclei, um, some with just a little bit of cytoplasm hanging off the end of the tail, um, and then some with a little bit more. Here's another case that we have where maybe this cytoplasm looks a little more dense, but um, I think it's still more glandular. You can tell from the side over here. The nuclei, the nuclear borders are round, but they're a little, they're starting to get a little elongated or not elongated, oval, I would say. Um, and a little dense here and there. And then over on this side of this group, much more crowded, overlapping, jumping on each other. Um, good old drunken honeycomb as you were. And then we have this group here, another group of endocer uh, endocervical cells nuclei about the same size, maybe a little elongated on the edges, um, but too crowded, right? There is no honeycomb going on here. And I'll just kind of leave you with this picture as we go to the poll, which is this poll. The question is, um, What's your interpretation with the added information later on that we had an HPV 18 positive on this one? So this is obviously this patient's 39. She came in with co-testing. Um, the HPV results come out. Um, and this is a question that some labs wait for those HPV results. Some don't. Some are outsourcing those HPV results. So they can't necessarily come together and coordinate into one report. Um, that would be another kind of maybe um, discussion for a different day. So, and our folks, our results are AIS for 37%, followed by a high sill for 33%. So over 60% think it's AIS or a high sill. And how come it won't go? There we go. The lab called it atypical endocervical cells, AGC. The CAS, kind of in the same idea, right? AIS for 60%, um, followed by atypical glandular cells for 25, and uh, um, two people thought a high grade lesion. 
Um, a cervical biopsy was done for this patient and it showed CIN3 with gland involvement. So those of you who thought more high grade, yep. And when they're in those glands and those squamous are in those glands, they do take on the architecture, if you will, of um, atypical glandular cells. We know that AIS um, and atypical glandular cells often go hand in hand with, um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. High grade and atypical glandular cells can be seen together, especially if they're in those glands. So, and I think that if we look back here, you know, there is maybe some dense parts to this, um, these groups that could be in the gland. So, okay. All there right. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, get to some of the questions our participants are asking. First of all, thank you both very much. This is a good review for the uh, glandular lesions, which are uh, notoriously difficult uh, for us uh, practicing cytologists. Um, let's see. Uh, one of them is how do you differentiate between high grade or AGC or adenocarcinoma? And the participant says, I sometimes find it pretty difficult, and I totally agree with the participant. Sometimes it's Absolutely. difficult to distinguish between these. Um, are there any morphologic tips saying to, if you see this, you know, you should think mm -hmm. of it? You know, I think, um, and everyone, I'll just start, but you can all come in as well. For me, one of the things that I do when I'm seeing those clusters or the hyperchromatic crowded groups, I'm going to go straight, and then since I'm over here, I'm going to go straight to the edge and try and figure out where that cytoplasm is coming from because that helps me decide then where they're coming from. And then um, as a cytotech, if I'm, you know, I'm going through the slide, I'm looking at it, I'm going to see these crowded groups and I'm like, well, this one seems more like this edge, this to me is glandular. And then I'm going to go over to this other one and I'm like, nope, these are not glandular. That's a dense cytoplasm, definitely a different cytoplasm to it. So these groups are going to be high grade or squamous to me or metaplastic. And of course, um, you know, the idea of where does the metaplastic cells and the endocervical cells start and stop? Um, and, you know, can we call them metacervicals ever? I don't know. <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> uh, Do you guys, so to me, um, it's always looking at the edge. But Look at the edge. That, that is true. If it looks columnar, then you go that direction. If the uh, cytoplasm is dense, you go the squamous direction or evacuated, you go that direction. But, but then it is true. Sometimes it's difficult to, um, and maybe there's a mishmash of all, where you see, like like you showed here, the glandular involvement of the H cell, or you have a um, you know adenocarcinoma arising in the junction, and that's those are difficult. Do you guys? Um, you didn't show here today, but do you guys ever use cell blocks to help out? Uh, I have not personally, but I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we do. That's that. just me. That's just me. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of a maybe another um, like a preparation type to look at, and maybe mm -hmm. more cells to look at to sort of try and identify it, you know, one way or another. And of course, if you have the cell block, you can possibly do um, stains if you need to. So that could sort of help too. Uh, yep. Let me move on to a different question uh, okay. from another participant. And they're querying the mitotic figures. So if you see mitotic figures, um, what do you do with a solitary mitotic figure in a pap? Oh, they ask. Yeah, right. You go look for more. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you look at the pattern is going on as well. So if I'm seeing a single mitotic figure in a pap, um, and I'm seeing a um, repair other places and it's and it's a very definite repair and and maybe there's you know an organism along with it but all of the nuclei beyond those groups where repair is um look normal i'm gonna and i only find one and i will tell you i will go back and look for it again um at least once um 
I'm going to probably just note it as a cytotech. I might send that case up to the pathologist and say, look, this is repair, but hey, I'm seeing this metatonic figure. Um, whether or not it's passing the buck to the pathologist, maybe. That's <laughs> um, totally fine. <laughs> Remember, we that's why eight, we work together, uh, right? That's, that's why we right. work together. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. And, and, and to, to that point, you know, I, I do remember just growing up as a fellow, I do remember Dr. Tina Fenning at MD Anderson saying, you cells got to grow, you see mitotic figures doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant. Exactly. So, you know, people listening, just so you see a mitotic figure doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant. Yeah, one but, of um, anything isn't really going to be helpful. Exactly, including one of one atypical cell sort of thing. Um there was a question on, I think, one of your cases. They were asking um, the one uh, case, I cannot remember the number, but it had some clear cell features and had oh, yeah. sort of a knobby architecture. They're wondering if there was any staining for napsin or HNF on the clear cell component. Um, I don't know. We don't. I'm going to say that at the time, yes. I don't have any information of whether or not they did extra. Um, testing for that. Um, yeah, so we get we get the specimens donated to Whole Logic gotcha. and then we'll reach back out to the lab to get the lab's information. So yes. if that was their final diagnosis, then then it's likely since it's so specific that they may have done special stains, but they didn't provide that information to us. I see. I see. Okay. All right. Good to know that. Um, Here's a case if you're interested again in yes, seeing that was it. Actually it's so really pretty. Good. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is, Michelle. It sure is. <laughs> um, okay, what other questions do we have here? Uh, another question about the HPV result. Now, this is a different case. I think case number six, they say. Uh, they were wondering how knowing the HPV result will influence the report. Um, it looks like a clear cell. Don't we just call it clear cell? Is the uh, comment on that one? What are your thoughts? I suppose it uh, helps to know it's HPV positive and yeah, <laughs> it's like of of what our clinical practice has become is that it's very helpful to know um, because it's related to both the squamous and the glandular. Um, it's not always helpful to help differentiate the the origin of the abnormal cells, but knowing that there's high risk HPV positivity, you know, really pushes you to know that there's a lesion there. Mm -hmm. Well, or, or, or it not. still could be a, yeah. you know, glandular <laughs> lesion, which is HPV positive too. So, yeah. right. Like it could be yeah. an endocervical adenocarcinoma. It would be much less likely an endometrial adenocarcinoma. Maybe it could help exactly. you with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it, it, we all do it together now. I think most people do, but you know, the idea of, you know, will it sway you into saying if I have atypical glandular cells and I have this positive 18, you know, will that make me go even a little farther? I don't think so. If the cells don't tell you the story, then you're just going to still call it atypical glandular cells. Right. Give the information to the clinician and based on, you know, history, that person's still going to cope, right? Yes, yeah, that is true. And that is one of the most important things that listeners should take. Um, AGC is actually a serious diagnosis, which will take yes. you to col col colposcopy, as opposed yep. to ask us maybe as a wait and see sort of diagnosis. And uh, right. that's going to fly in the new ASCCP uh, treatment guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, another participant asks if you could uh, kindly show a watery diathesis. And I can't remember <laughs> which which one it was, um, but oh, I. That's a good question. That is one or two. I think you had this is I do remember. Four two. Let's see. I'll try. I'll try. Okay, I'm gonna try this one here. Yeah. This one, I think. Okay, so I uh, and I uh, I'm, I'm like, uh, uh, uh. 
to, to me, some of the watery diathesis is this little bit of fluff that you might see in the background. Um, maybe I don't even have the right case. Hang on. No, this wasn't the one. Sorry. Um, I have to find it. For me, though, and I until I can find it, um, a watery diathesis for me in, in cytology as a cytotech who, uh, like I said, I'm not very, didn't feel I was very good at it until I saw so many of them, um, is, and this is going to sound weird, I think, maybe, but as you're evaluating the cells and the background and you feel like you want to take the slide off the microscope and clean it off because it it feel it looks like there's it's not a color or it's not but it it like a dirty background is what you mean yeah yeah it's like like when you're well like if you wear glasses and and you know that you haven't cleaned them in a while <laughs> and and it's it's that filmy i guess a film to it okay um and to me that's kind of one of the things that helps me look at that. I'm going to see if I can find one here. Go to the, Michelle, Michelle, go to the last case. I know we haven't looked at it yet, but um, that last one. Okay. All right. While you do that, let me ask uh, sort of another question. Uh, the question is, which scanner are you guys using for these? It's a, it's a hologic developed scanner. Hologic developed scanner. Okay. They were saying oh, yeah. that Pictures are beautiful. They were commending on you on your um, oh, scan. Nice. Okay, good. There you have it. Go, yeah, go out a little bit, Michelle. You can see some of the, there's some blood, but you can also see the stringy. Yeah, this kind of stringy bits. Uh, let's see if I can find a different one. Uh, maybe. I'll go out here. There we go. So with the, the hanging diathesis, which is like around a, a group of cells, is different than this watery background. And with liquid base cytology, it does make this kind of stringy background. And maybe it's because when I learned, I had to learn watery diathesis on an actual slide, uh, <laughs> on a smear. <laughs> but that's because I'm old. You're not. <laughs> so this sort of kind of things are helpful i think of if you're screening a slide and you're seeing these bits that are kind of in the way a little bit but not quite um and they they just seem to be hanging out for no apparent reason mm -hmm. to me is more of a watery diathesis but that's me Nice. So that's good. I think that's that's yeah, that's that's nice to show so that um you know our students or residents who are seeing this can have an idea about what that looks like. One more one more, Michelle, where we got yep. some time at least that the one eight one 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 six, the fifteenth case. Yeah, one eight one one six that oh, we just went past it. Oh, it's at the top now. Oh, I see it. There we go. Right this there. one. Oh yeah, this is it. This is it. This is a watery diathesis. Right. Excellent. And this is that stuff to me that I would be like wanting to wipe away. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very nice way of describing it. I don't think I've heard of that, but I like that. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. Um, okay, let me ask you this last question. There's a lot of questions coming in our way, but we're uh, running yeah, we're a little running bit out of time. Side. Yeah, we're running out of time. Um, so this participant says uh, they do mostly conventional cytology and they feel that it's difficult to do glandular lesions. Can you comment on uh, conventional cytology and perhaps are there any tips to do that on conventional cytology? Um, that could help them. 
Yes, it's hard. <laughs> and, and I will say, um, you know, I trained on conventional cytology and worked for many years in public health laboratory. So we were one of the later people that ever converted to liquid-based cytology in, in the U.S. Um, and I think that um, it can be much harder because of the air drying part of it. Um, one thing to that, I would suggest if you can, if you're doing conventional smears, is really work with your clinicians to make sure that they're fixing this the slide properly so that you so that you can kind of get a mitigate that air dried part. Because once the cells are blown up, they're so hard to figure out, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Um, and we have found, I found that in the past that if you could go to clinicians and say these are this is why it's so important to fix these slides as soon as possible, um, it makes your life a little bit easier. I think the criteria is the criteria, though. That's right. Yeah, it, it didn't change over time. Yeah, that's the no. same. Yeah, I once heard um, Dr. Demay gave a talk, and he said that he had no problem with a conventional PAP, and he thought that a good conventional PAP was just as diagnostic as a liquid-based. But he said, these days, I'm not seeing very good, very many good conventional paths. And yeah. I think that, I think your point is true, Michelle, is that working with your clinicians to make sure that they know their technique and get it fixed as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. then you should be able to get the criteria that you need to, to, do, to make your job, do your job. Right. And I think more and more younger clinicians aren't trained in that. You know, they're... It's so, and it is definitely technique. Yeah. Yes. yes. But well, I do love a good conventional smear. I have to say, again, I'm old. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that scares me. But hey, power to you. Power to you. I would say, you know, I would agree with Dr. Demay that a, a well prepared and well stained conventional pap is is art so you know it, that's it, just me it's, it's as good as it gets but right now if i had to if i had my choice and i had to screen you know slides all day long uh i would not go back on that bandwagon probably See? <laughs> well ladies thank you both very much uh okay tough topic and thank you for covering these uh we appreciate your time and thank you everyone for uh joining in on the webinar today and see you next week all right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.